what would be most useful for you in our conversation today? I guess um, digging into logical reasonings, uh, especially with regards to more difficult questions, um, uh, I think uh, I could still uh, brush up on maybe the more difficult aspects of sufficient assumption, necessary assumption questions, or things of that nature. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So I assume you have a good handle on the difference between each of those types? That's right, I believe so. Okay, so when do you diagram, if at all? Um, I diagram, and, I, and I'd love to learn more about diagramming because that would be helpful. Um, when I see uh, conditional reasoning or, um, or something of that nature in the argument. Good, solid. So when you see a lot of conditional statements, oftentimes conditional indicators, oftentimes in a way that nobody would ever speak in everyday life, that's, right. that's a good indication that you want to diagram. Now, sufficient assumption questions often lend themselves to diagramming. They're often formulaic. And I actually have an article on my site laying out the six major categories of sufficient assumptions that you can diagram. So definitely check that out. I'll send you a link to it afterwards. Absolutely. Sounds good. Now, necessary assumption questions, I never diagram these. These are more informal logic or inductive reasoning where you actually have to engage with the argument in a real world sense. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, negating the, the answer choice is the correct choice when negated will destroy the argument. And I think about necessary assumption questions like being a very specific kind of must be true question. Mm -hmm. How does that sit with you? That makes sense. I mean, the, the assumption must be true for the argument to work. And if you negate it, if it's not true, then the argument does not work, correct? Correct, exactly. Just, you know, any other advice for, you know, I'm sure I'm getting, you know, I have two 169s on record, so I'm, I'm almost there as far as breaking 170. Um, so I think I'm probably getting the medium and easy questions right. It's probably the harder ones. You know that part when you're in, Pat, when you're in a section, you just, it feels like you just ran into concrete, like everything just has to slow down because everything's getting so dense or, or, or wordy. Um, you know, and you got four or five of those questions in a row that kind of like, at the end, you know, I might skip them or I might go through them quickly and then come back to them at the end. And, and those questions are more or less what determine my, my score. You know, if I do well on them, then I might get a little higher. If I, if I don't do so well, then I get a little lower score. Um, so you know, what, are these, what are these tough questions that give you trouble if you have a run on them? It's a disaster. If not, it's a great score. What are these tough questions? Yeah. Um, I've had a little trouble recently with parallel, parallel flaw questions as well, um, and uh, and or parallel argument questions, especially ones that require conditional, like well, ones that would be, where I would benefit from diagramming, for example. Okay, so the parallel questions where you want to diagram again, it comes down to that formal, tight language you don't see in everyday speech. Mm -hmm. Not all parallel questions are like this, but some are, mm -hmm. and so when you have them diagram them, but don't diagram all the choices as well. Diagram only the stimulus and then mentally try to map each of the choices onto the stimulus. Mm -hmm. But if you were to diagram all of them, that's diagramming six arguments, the stimulus plus the five choices for the benefit of getting only one correct answer. So definitely not a great value there. Totally. Yeah, I see that. Makes sense. Parallels, I would also consider saving them for last just because they are more time consuming. Now, if it's a number nine, I would say handle it in the moment because although it's parallel, number nine suggests it's an easier method of reasoning. But if it's anything 15 or later, you're probably best off skipping it, flagging it, coming back to it at the very end. For sure, for sure. But you'll get a lot more value out of working on things like necessary assumption and sufficient assumption just because they come up a lot and mm -hmm. the techniques to approach them are a bit more clear. Like there's usually one major way to approach each of them. Necessary assumption, negating the choices, correct choice when negated, destroys the argument. Sufficient mm -hmm. assumption, sometimes diagramming, not always, but having that as a tool in your toolkit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about um, flaw questions? Sometimes I, I don't spot the flaw, although I guess that's, it's a bit more difficult because you know there's hundreds if not thousands of flaws that you can come up with, I guess, aside from the common ones like, uh, uh, an ad hominem attack or, or something of that nature? Yeah, for flaw questions, you'll have your classic logical fallacies like ad hominem or reversal, negation, 
things of that correlation causation, things of that nature. But most flaws are not some classic list of logical fallacies. They're really just the argument failed to consider something they should have considered, mm -hmm. or they're taking something for granted that they should not have considered. And so that requires, once again, that real world engagement, just like you want to have with necessary assumption questions. We're really considering the argument, how reasonable is it? And for necessary assumption, we're extending the principle of generosity to the speaker saying they did not fail to consider something, they just did not bother to explicitly state it. But for a flaw question, we're saying the argument is guilty of a crime. Let's figure out which crime they're guilty of that we can charge them with that. Hmm. Can you make that distinction clear for me one more time? Yeah, sure. So for necessary, basically lots of logical reasoning arguments contain gaps. Mm, now, right. for necessary assumption questions, we are extending the principle of generosity to the speaker, saying they did not fail to consider something, they just did not bother to explicitly state that underlying necessary assumption. Mm -hmm. But for flaw questions, we're saying whatever they didn't mention, whatever that gap is, they did not even realize the mistake they were making. They did mm -hmm. not realize they were failing to, to consider something and failing to state it. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a parallel there between possibly necessary assumption questions and flaw questions, except in the case where there's a, a necessary assumption question that's missing in a flaw, then that's a flaw of the argument. And that might be the answer right there. Exactly. So it's all about how you frame it, the perspective from which you view the argument. Exactly. And uh, any insights with regards to weakening or strengthening questions, um, especially at the high level, uh, difficult questions and things like that? Yeah, sure. So I think it all comes down to alternate possibilities and explanations. That's a big category. So for strengthening questions, we're dismissing alternate possibilities in favor of the stated one. For weaken, mm -hmm. we are saying that that possible alternate explanation is more likely. We're promoting the likelihood of that being a factor. If an argument is based upon a study or a survey, you might, for weakening, attack the way in which the study or survey was conducted to strengthen the argument we would say the study or survey was well conducted. And then of course, there's always new information. You're looking for that real world engagement where you're thinking outside the box. And this takes time and you do more questions, you'll see more of the patterns in what they like to ask about, what possibilities arise. Um, real, uh, you were speaking about, um, I think, uh, realizing a pattern of, of questions they like to answer with regards to arguments, but then you're also talking about just using a common sense approach to engaging the argument and, and arguing with it, so to speak, to realize its weaknesses or its, or its or the assumptions that are missing in it, for example. Exactly. And what I was going to say is with regard to prephrasing that a lot of times people will try to prephrase the answer to a strength and a weakened question. And the truth is that there are multiple correct ways to strengthen or weaken an argument. There are a variety of possible factors. And the one that they bring up in the choice will not always be the one that you thought of. So you have to be open to the idea that there are multiple ways to do it mm -hmm. and don't be married to only one idea. And people ask, is prephrasing useful? It mm -hmm. is, but it's not the only thing because there's multiple ways. That's right. It's a powerful tool, but it's not the end all be all. And um, any, any advice when you get down to that point where you have like one or two questions and you're in your, or when, you're, when you have one or two answers and you're between them, you do like a close reading of the stimulus again, or do you, you know, how do you get to that point when you're, you're at a 50 50 and you're trying to make well, the right decision? I would check if the, each of the choices against the stimulus don't fall into the trap of comparing them to each other. Mm -hmm. mm, I see. Any, any advice or insights for when, you know, uh, this is outside of uh, logical reasoning, but logic games, you know, just um, not making a silly mistake. I find that I might go minus one just because I made a silly mistake or how to get really like airtight with them. Well, I would always double check the rules before going on to the questions. Make sure right. that you have correctly diagrammed the rules. Nothing is backwards. Nothing is off just a little bit. And mm -hmm. if there's a complicated rule, slow down and take the time to thoroughly understand it before you go on to the questions. Because if there's anything that's off or anything you don't fully understand, that's going to have a ripple effect over the course of the entire game. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, I guess that's all as, as far as like, you know, else else I related questions. I have. Before we send off, what would you say is the biggest insight you got from our call today? Mm, biggest insight, um, really understanding when it is strategic to diagram. When you start hitting that really tight formal language, that's unnatural. Consider diagramming. 
or you see a lot of conditional reasoning. And um, especially when you're working with the like parallel flaw questions, you know, don't, die, don't try to diagram the whole thing, but diagram the stimulus and then try to mentally apply the um, uh, answer choices to the diagram of the stimulus. I think those were very helpful insights. Awesome. Well, please keep in touch and let me know if I can help in any way as you move forward. Thank you. You got it. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.